Okay, Article 6. Uh, this is about eye injuries in kids. There's actually quite a few PEDS articles this there time. There are, actually. I guess they did have yeah. a PEDS theme. Yeah, a little PEDS theme. Yeah. So this one's about eye injuries in kids, non-penetrating eye injuries in kids. It's by Root, Gupta, and Jamal. It's in Clinical Pediatric Emergency Medicine, mm -hmm. which is a very subspecialty it little is. paper. Okay, so lots of kids get hurt in the eye. It's very common, almost a million, 840,000. Most of them are minor. Some of them show up in the ER. And we're going to talk about some of the most common non-penetrating eye injuries in kids. And many of these things are going to be very familiar to you. Yeah. Um, and, but they point out a few little interesting caveats about kids that are a little different from adults. Obviously, there are guiding principles here. If somebody comes in with an eye injury, they maybe have been involved in other types of trauma. So you want to not just focus in on the eye. Don't forget there could be other life threats. And one of the big questions is, is this globe intact or not? Mm -hmm. um, remember that the vital sign of the eye is vision. So you got to assess your visual acuity. And obviously, an ophthalmologist will be something that you will need in the case of a real eye emergency. Now, kids are difficult to assess when it comes to eyes. Yeah, and so they're not going to be able to cooperate with a lot of the things that you normally do. And so they give you some little pearls here about how how to assess kids. Mm -hmm. um, and, but again, ultimately, that may be one of the reasons you need a pediatric ophthalmologist to help you because it's hard. It's hard it to is. get all the information that you might need. Ophthalmology is a tough field in general. Yeah. So it's so specialized. I <laughs> mean, is. you know, you read one of those opto notes and I don't know half of what But I love the fact that some are retinas and some yes. are only oh, yeah. corneas. Right. and some, yeah. Just do glaucoma. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So remember that it, the approach to any eye injury, PEDS included, there's a stepwise approach. And when you're talking about visual acuity, you want to make sure if they can't even read the letters or the, or the symbols or the pictures that you're showing them, do they even have light perceptions? So that's, a, that's a really important question. You want to assess visual acuity in both eyes, no matter what, whether whatever one is injured, you still want to assess visual acuity in both eyes. You want to inspect the external part of the eye, the periorbital tissues and eyelids. You want to look at the eye movements. You want to look at the anterior surface of the eye. Then you want to think about ruling out ruptured globe. You're going to consider dilating the pupil, and they do talk about that in this paper. You want to examine for the red reflex. Mm -hmm. That's something that you can get in kids. And then, obviously, there's direct ophthalmoscopy. Ophthalmoscopy. Yes. For papilledema, retinal hemorrhages, when you want to take a look at the back of the eye, that's going to be particular tough in kids. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Okay, visual acuity. You want to do a formal visual acuity. Now, kids can't all read, so you may have to have them. Uh, they have. They do have kids do. eye charts that mm -hmm. have like a boat Pictures, and like yeah. yeah stuff like that. So you might need one of those types of charts. But again, you could even have them count fingers. So it's going to be child appropriate depending on their age. What if they can't even open their eye? Well, you got it. You can at least use a pen light and see if they can see light. And if they can't tell you, remember that if you shine light in their eye, they can perceive it. They're probably going to reflexly close their eyes. So keep an eye out for that contraction of the eyelid. That will tell you that at least they're mm -hmm. perceiving the light. Um, if they don't have great visual acuity, remember that a pinhole can help you in terms of diagnosing whether this is a refractive error or not, which kids can get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we're looking at periorbital tissues and eyelids now, and we're looking for ptosis. We're looking for ecchymosis. We're looking for lacerations. We want to look at those extraocular movements. We might have to do that in some fun way yeah. with our iPhone or with parents to help you get the kid to look around the room, which could be kind of fun. It is fun. Making actually. a game. In terms of ruptured globe, remember that before you even start assessing it, the eye itself can give you some clues. Sometimes the eye, because the fluid is leaking out, looks like it's deflated, like the it's basketball little, little is raisin, flat, yeah, like the ball is flat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, though, it can look normal. So just the fact that it looks normal doesn't mean that it's not an open globe. You want to look for that little bit of iris or the choroid that's sort of coming out through the wound or trying to plug the tissue, it's, whether it's black or blue, whatever the color it is. That's not normal and yeah. maybe an open globe. <laughs> Your pupil can be teardrop shaped. You might see the iris protruding. You can see hemorrhage or you can see circumferential subconjunctival hemorrhage that might happen as well. All those should raise your suspicion for a deeper injury. Now, again, a Seidel sign. This is a, a one that, they, that we've learned about in adults. It's true in kids, too. Um, if you put in fluorescein dye and there's actually fluid leaking out of the eye, then you will see basically streaming as the leaking aqueous that's spilling out of the penetrated globe is going to dilute your fluorescein. Mm -hmm. You'll see this little river that's coming out. And then basically, if that's negative and you, you're, there's no signs that are telling you for sure that it's ruptured, then you can consider dilating the eye. And that's that the point. next step. Mm -hmm. After all of that, after you've gotten pretty sure that it's not uh, ruptured, then you can put drops in if you want to dilate and now be able to look a little deeper. So they consider, they suggest consider dilating with phenylephrine or tropic tropicamide. I don't dilate that often. I uh, so I think this is kind of like if you're going to dilate, I, at this point, you may be in contact with your ophthalmologist and talk about whether or not you yeah, want to dilate or not. Usually the yeah, main thing. Don't yeah. use atropine. Yeah, that and you two weeks. And in terms of the dilating, um, you're look. What are you looking for? You're looking for papilledema. You're looking for retinal hemorrhages. I think it's going to be 
pretty tough to get a kid to cooperate with these things, but theoretically it's possible. And you might need topical anesthetics. You might need an ocular spectrum, speculum in terms of holding the mm -hmm. eye open if they can't really keep it open. Now, most of what you're going to see, um, they say uh, half of the eye injuries that we see in the ED are going to be corneal abrasions. Super, super common. They're uncomfortable, and they happen all the time. This is an epithelial defect on the surface of the eye. It can happen from blood trauma. It can happen from, from a foreign body that gets caught in there. It could happen from contact lenses or from some kind of burn that could happen. These people have a lot of sharp, severe eye pain. They're, they're photophobic. The light is bothering them. They, it's uncomfortable to blink. They're tearing. They have a sensation that there's a foreign body in there, and they may have a history of eye trauma as well, depending on what caused it in the first place. If we think that there's traumatic iritis involved in terms of it being a meiotic or, or midriatic, a small or big pupil, um, or you think it goes deeper into the eye, then that's something you would call ophthalmology for because they might need steroids and we're mm -hmm. not going to give steroids without talking to ophthalmology. If the pupil doesn't look normal, that's something I'd call ophthalmology for. If you see a hypopion, that white level in the anterior chamber that's white cells layering out, that's something to call opto for. And any kind of corneal infiltrates, if you think there's something deeper going on, we're calling opto. Remember, this is a kid's eye. Right. So we're going to be generous with those consults. In terms of exam, you might be able to see uh, what you can see on your direct exam. Fluorescein, you can always use that woods lamp or you want that, that blue light to help see what the fluorescein's lighting up. You want to use a topical anesthetic to make things more comfortable. Um, and in terms of abrasions, you may see a linearly, linear lesion or something that's sort of geographically, like the ice rink sign mm -hmm. or something that's you know, more indicative of what's been going on. Um, and if you do see that ice rink sign or multiple vertical lines and you haven't found a foreign body yet, remember to evert the lid, yeah. use your little cotton swab and flip it up and look around for a foreign body that might be stuck there. What do we want to do for these people with a corneal abrasion? Well, we want to relieve their pain. We want to make sure they don't get an infection because now they have an epithelial defect and we want to improve their healing. And so they talk about using um, topical NSAIDs, that mm -hmm. these can be pretty useful. It decreases the needs for things like opiates or oral pain meds. And people can go back to work yeah. if you're talking about adults sooner. Um, they do give you some caution and say, you know, if you're going to use these, don't, use, don't let them use it long term. Limit it for a couple days because they talk about this term <laughs> called <laughs> corneal melting, melting, which I hadn't really oh. read before, but I guess this is a thing. It's a is toxicity it, yeah. with topical NSAIDs, and it can melt your cornea, yeah, so that doesn't sound so good. good. Probably, probably not, not good. good. Okay, <laughs> other things for pain relief, obviously if you have the iris sphincter involved and the photophobia involved, you can use cycloplegics to also help with that kind of spasm that's associated with, particularly with traumatic iritis. And so you use cyclopentylate, mm -hmm. 1%, mm -hmm. uh, one drop, and if you have an uncomplicated case and they're having a lot of pain, you might consider using this to, in, in terms of an adjunct for pain relief. Topical anesthetics are super useful. Using a proparacaine or tetracaine, that comes, it helps so much. You know, it's quick on. It lasts for about 20 minutes. You know, they perpetuate, mm -hmm. they perpetuate the myth here that you cannot use it as outpatient yes, treatment. Uh, and so we know that that's probably not true. But in this but in paper, this article, in this yes. article, they say don't use it as outpatient treatment because of the theoretical concerns about delayed wound healing and that you might scratch your own eye and there could be some toxicity there. So that's what they advocate for in this they paper. Do. Now, we don't patch eyes, but they do mention that if you have a kid who's going to rub that eye or can't leave it alone, that might be a circumstance where you might mm -hmm. patch that eye to facilitate its healing. So that's an imp important little point there. Different, I, you know, difference in kids. Difference yeah. in kids. Um, and if they have a really large corneal abrasion, like it's more than 50% of the corneal surface, that might be oh. another case where you patch the eye. Now, in terms of infection prophylaxis, we've heard this debate before. Do they really need prophylactic antibiotics or not? And really, the way they no. kind of frame it is like, well, you know what? The ointment could actually be soothing. And so, you know, using the ointment and antibiotic ointment may actually have some pain relief component to it as well. So they, they, they point out erythromycin ointment wouldn't be so bad. But, but don't use neomycin. neomycin. Right. Don't use neomycin. It's got a hypersensitivity to it. And don't use steroids um, because, we, you know, you're only going to use those if you're talking to your ophthalmologist and there's a reason to give those because, obviously, infection is more likely in those cases. Don't forget about contact lenses. Now, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a lot of kids out there wearing contact lenses, but if we're talking about teenagers, mm -hmm. a little bit older kids, there's kids out there that might be wearing contact. Anytime you hear the word contact lens and eye, you should immediately think about pseudomonas. That is what they're trying to get at. And it's a bad thing, obviously, because you could rapidly progress from just a corneal abrasion to perforation and visual loss. If you're worried about contact lenses and you want to cover pseudomonas in the eye, the answer is topical ciprofloxacin. Um, and they make it as an ointment. Mm -hmm. You can use it that way. Um, and they also there's also other fluoroquinolone that are made into ophthalmologic logic, uh, preparations, moxifloxacin, gadifloxacin, and other alternatives would be tobramycin, for example. These people are not just your regular old corneal abrasion. They actually need opto follow-up, and you don't, they do not want to put that contact lens back in that eye until mm -hmm. all is clear. 
in general, corneal abrasions are going to heal in the 24 to 48 hour period. And a lot of them don't need any follow-up. The only ones that you might follow up are ones that are particularly large. They say greater than four millimeters, contact lens associated, or they're still pretty symptomatic after 48 hours. It's yeah, kind of not going away. Yeah. Then there's something, something probably else. else going on. Right. They're, yeah, corneal abrasions are so common, and we don't see a lot of complications, but complications can happen. Some of the examples of complications they point out are bacterial keratitis, especially if there was some kind of plant substance involved, agriculturally related, for example. Um, other complications of corneal abrasions could include traumatic iritis or corneal ulcers, and that could progress to permanent vision loss, uh, you know, ultimately speaking, if you were to just go down the, the worst mm -hmm. path possible. Now, burns, ocular burns from chemicals are something that can particularly happen in kids. Yeah. They get into chemicals and house cleaning stuff at home and it gets in their eye. And that really is a big deal because mm -hmm. we know that alkali and acids are both really bad. Alkali is worse than acids. Alkali is the one that causes the liquefaction necrosis. Yeah. Versus, There's your melting eyeball. That's your, that's melting, your eyeball melting eyeball. Versus coagulation necrosis that's associated with acidic things. But this is a really, really big deal. And that kid should be coming to the ER right away and they need a immediate evaluation. This can happen from household cleaners. This can happen from like cosmetics and it can be a big deal. Alkali is worse than acid as mentioned. Acid actually doesn't tend to go too deep. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But alkali, which is a lot of these cleaning liquids can really make a big deal and cause this terrible corrosion. Don't forget about hydrofluoric acid, which is never good in any exam question that I ever were to never, ask ever. you. <laughs> it's in those rust removers. It's in glass polish. And the burn is just terrible. It's just going to be this terribly progressive alkali type of burn. How do kids with chemical burns to the eye or anyone with chemical burns to the eye present? They're going to have a lot of pain, decreased vision. They're going to have a lot of blepharospasm, photophobia, a lot of conjunctival hyperemia, chemosis. And how long it's been in contact with the eye structures is really going to determine how bad things look. So what is the answer here? We have got to irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. We've got to get that substance off the eye. And so, and they really say, it doesn't matter what you use. Mm -hmm. You want to use saline, just LR, anything. water, anything. A Morgan lens can be helpful because it just kind of keeps it going. This can be really uncomfortable. And for kids, this may even mean that you have to procedurally sedate this yep. kid to get it done. It. And I could see that just absolutely scrunch happen. their eyes shut. Yep. Yeah, they're just going to fight you and fight you and not understand how important this is. And because time is of the essence, then sedation yep. may be something you need to do. Topical anesthetics can also be really, really helpful. So we're talking about at least 30 minutes of continuous irrigation. And really what you're aiming for is a, is a normal target pH. And so you want to get to that pH that's around seven. You can you basically go a little bit up, a little bit down, um, but that's really what you're going for. And, and you so need the paper. You need the real paper. You need not, the real yeah, pH paper. Yeah. Yeah. Can't, can't use your urine dipstick or no. you need real pH paper. Yeah, you need pH paper and you can check it in the other eye to kind of mm -hmm. see what their baseline pH is and that's kind of what you're, you're aiming for. And once you get that goal pH, that's when you can say I'm done with this part of it. You also want to look for any kind of, could there have been some particulate matter in there you want to look for as well. And so pain control is going to be huge. You're going to want to give cycloplegics, topical antibiotic ointment. After all is said and done, these are going to be part of your uh, aftercare and opto is going to be involved in these cases. Now, hyphemas can happen to kids as well. This is blood in the anterior chamber. This is usually when you get, you know, the ball to the eye or some kind of severe blunt trauma to the eye, usually sports related. And the big thing with hyphema and you get red blood cells in the eye, like other types of bleeding, you're going to have a little clot form and that clot is going to retract over time and then you're at risk for a rebound. Re and that's really mm -hmm. what you're mostly worried about is this. Yeah, not today. Not it's today. What's going to happen in the next two to seven days as that clot retracts and then bleeding happens again. It makes you think of that anterior labial yeah, exactly. artery thing. Right. Where you like get the clot retraction. Bite on the wire. And, yeah. Exactly. So hyphema is on the list for that same kind of mechanism. And that's a bad thing when it happens. Hyphemas present with, you know, I can't see as well, blurry vision, eye pain, pupillary constriction, damage around the eye associated with what got them there in the first place. And you usually can see a hyphema. Mm -hmm. And they are graded from one to four depending on the, the amount of blood in the anterior chamber. A grade one is less than a third all the way up to a grade four, which is a complete, what they call eight, eight ball, ball hyphema when the thing is just redded, redded out. Now, in these cases, if you can examine the posterior eye, which is going to be a real challenge, then that would be something you'd like to try to do. But of course, when you see that hyphema, you're thinking about, hey, this eye had a lot of blunt trauma. Is this a ruptured globe? And so you've got to measure IOP, although they tell us not to put pressure on, on eyes the eyes yeah. that we think might have a ruptured globe. But the ophthalmologist will always ask you what the pressure they is. They do. Some of the, and there's some devices now that yeah. don't put a lot of pressure on the eye to measure, depending yeah. what device you happen to use to measure eye pressures. So I think that's important. Mm -hmm. and, and, and actually, one of the diagnostic things for an open globe is when you have 
have low intraocular pressure because that fluid's been leaking out. And you want to think about their risk for that secondary rebleed. Kids who have sickle cell or sickle cell trait or hemophilia or von Willebrands, those kind of coagulopathies or um, um, blood dyscrasias. Yes, exactly. Uh, those are people More who are at risk for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and in, and you want to think about checking labs if indicated, whether you're going to do a CBC and coag or sickle cell testing, things like that. And we want to reduce those secondary complications. And so how could we do that? We have the head of the bed slightly elevated, 30 to 45 degrees. We, this is one of those yeah. cases we are going to shield the eye. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep the pain under control, no NSAIDs, and we don't want them throwing up, which is going to increase intraocular pressure. So antiemetics if that's going on. And if an ophthalmologist recommends topical corticosteroids, this will be something that we'll do. And the other things that are on the list that are kind of interesting are TXA. Yeah, so and, tranexamic acid. Yeah, TXA, tranexamic acid, and aminocaproic acid, which are things that stabilize the clot, which would be important in the case of a hyphema. Um, whether or not this actually decreases their risk of secondary hemorrhage, we don't really know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it might be something that your ophthalmologist might recommend. A hyphema can increase your intraocular pressure, which would put you at increased risk for glaucoma and closed angle glaucoma and things like that. So you want to get ophthalmology on board. Things that you might need to do to decrease that intraocular pressure could be things like that are on the glaucoma list, like topical beta blockers mm -hmm. or using carb carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, whether they're used topically, orally, or IV, um, but not in sickle cell patients. You don't want to give those to sickle cell patients. Mm -hmm. You don't want to give acetazolamide to those patients. You don't, uh, the, and one of the things that's mentioned in this paper is the transcorneal oxygen. Yeah. which is very interesting. And IV mannitol might be something on that list. Okay, some kids might need surgery. If they've got a big hyphema and it's lasting for eight to 10 days, they might need to go to surgery. If they've got complications like sickle cell, elevated intraocular pressure, they've got a lot of blood staining, their vision is really no good, they keep bleeding, those kind of kids are probably gonna go to surgery to have it intervened mm -hmm. upon. So this can be an outpatient or an inpatient thing. Depends on how compliant they could be. It depends on how much the hyphema, how much is involved. It depends on what their underlying risk factors are. So, you know, these are going to be questions that you're going to have in terms of determining the disposition. Could this have been child abuse? Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that there was penetrating ocular trauma? Do you think they're at really good risk for a rebleed? Is their hyphema more than 50%? Sicklers, those are people who are going to get admitted. Yeah, it's this interesting. Is, they don't mention um, social situation. Right. Which, which is, is something we would factor in. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. Now, fractures. They spend a good amount of time talking about or orbital fractures, and they point out that of all the pediatric facial fractures, half of them are going to be involved in the orbit, the orbit. which mm -hmm. is pretty amazing. There's lots of reasons this happens. There can be car accidents. There can be falls. Lots of sports-related things, violence-related things. Um, and kids that are over age five, blowout fractures are the most common orbital fracture in that age group. Again, this is going to start with your full eye exam and things you want to look at when you're talking about orbital trauma or is what that eye looks like. Do they have what they say is in ophthalmos, which is the sunken eye? Do they have orbital dys dystopia, which is basically displacement? Is, are the eyes sort of like farther apart kind of thing? Um, and do they have flattening of their telecanthus and their nasal complex? All of that, does that look normal to the parents or to you? Those could be, all be indications that there's an underlying fracture. You want to have them look up and look at those eye movements because remember, if you have a blowout fracture and you have entrapment of that inferior rectus muscle, they may have limited upward eye yeah, movement. Because so it's, it's stuck. Because it's stuck. And so that the inferior rectus it controls your upward eye movement. You also want to look for air in the facial tissues, and you want to examine their sensation because if they happen to have gotten their infraorbital nerve, they may have a numb cheek on that side or an upper lip on that side. You want to palpate around and look for fractures of the superior orbital rim or their frontal bone. And if those things are present, you're going to that's, need that's specialists a deal. involved. That's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. CT is really where we go. We used to talk about plain films. We, we, used, to, we used to learn it. how the plain films yep. look, but we're really over that now because CT mm -hmm. is just so much better. Yep. So you don't need contrast. CT without contrast to look for these fractures is the optimal imaging test when you're looking for facial fractures. And obviously these are kids, so you don't want to CT willy-nilly. You want to mm -hmm. CT judiciously. If, it really, if you really have a suspicion and you want to define what that fracture is, CT is the way to go but just be careful in kids that we're not just ordering it just because they you know they just have a black eye you know really think about whether you think they have a fracture or not some kids might need surgery if they have a big large orbital floor defect or they've got the muscle entrapment or they really have extraocular movement problems and diplopia they may need surgery and some cases may need antibiotics if they've got a history of sinusitis, they're, diabe they're diabetic, they're immunocompromised, stuff like that. Other things that they may recommend could be nasal decongestants just to mm -hmm. kind of avoid any kind of blowing of the nose, increase of the pressure, because we really don't want that. That's no. going to blow air into the whole situation and make it worse. Your face blows up and yeah. gets all that sub-Q air. Not yeah, good. Not a good idea. 
Now, there are people who could, there are kids who could present with eye injuries that are more on the subacute side. And so they're coming in a little bit later. And this is going to be a little bit more complicated because you may need to look at parts of the eye that are hard for you to look at. But things like traumatic iritis or traumatic uveitis, where they've had their eye trauma a day or two or three ago, and now they're coming in because their eye is hurting and it's red. And you see on their slit lamp, if you could do a slit lamp, depending on the age of the kid, you see those kind of cell and flare in the anterior chamber. Those are kids you're going to, again, call ophthalmologists and they may need, you may need to dilate and look a little further, and they may need steroids again. No, no topical steroids without calling an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. Some other presentations that they describe are things like retrobulbar neuritis, which is really kind of an optic neuritis, choroidal rupture, retinal detachment, mm -hmm. and commotio retinae. I love that. That's a good one. These are visual loss. These cases, are visual, right? yes, exactly. So retrobulbar neuritis is an optic neuritis. Now, this can happen, optic neuritis can happen from other things as well. It could be infectious, it could be inflammatory, mm -hmm. it could be MS. That's MS, the thing in adults right. that we think of as a classic association. And they may have a, a wide variety of visual loss complaints. It could be very minimal to very complete. It could be color vision could be involved as well. And they may have pain, pain with eye movement in particular. They can have an APD or decreased pupillary response to light. And if you think that those things are going on, obviously an ophthalmologist is going to get involved. Choroidal rupture can also happen. Again, this may be subacute. They had their trauma a few days ago, and they're complaining of now they can't see as well. And if you could see their retina, you might see white or yellow crescent-shaped streaks that they say are there. But it might be hard to see if they've got blood. It might be hard to see in general. But mm -hmm. that could be on the list of possibilities. I think we're pretty familiar with retinal detachment because yep. we consider they it a lot about in this. adults. Mm -hmm. And this is true. And just, I guess the point is this can happen in, in kids as well. And if they're able to verbalize that they see flashes or floaters or curtains uh, with or without any visual loss, then yes, consider retinal detachment. And you know, it, this is going to be hard if a kid can't tell you exactly what they're seeing or experiencing. Mm -hmm. But if you think that this is on the menu, again, as, as it is in adults and they have any vision left, urgent ophthalm consult is important because our uh, ability to really do ophthalmology Endoscopy in these kids is really like limited. Zero. <laughs> Now, if you have, you know, commotio cortis, you can yes, have I commotio retinae, which is basically you have this blunt trauma creating these shock waves, and this disrupts your very sensitive little photoreceptors. And now you have decreased vision from just the blunt shock wave that happened. And if you were able to do fundoscopy, they tell us that you would see this retinal whiteout kind of thing, which is interesting. They say that it improves. You don't have to do anything. It'll just kind of get better. It's kind of that's scary, though. Can you I imagine? mean, <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Your vision no problem. probably will come back. I don't know. But you can get Get commotio retinae. Iridodialysis. This is where your iris separates from your sclera. This can happen from blunt or penetrating trauma, usually asymptomatic. They can develop glaucoma, um, and they need to wear sunglasses, and they might get surgery if it's pretty bad. So <clears throat> just to remind, to, to remind us, sort of a summary here. So we've got alkali burns. That's a really big deal. They can perforate or rupture their globe. Uh, so, the, so the alkali burns is kind of in one column. They call like kind of the most emergent thing. Be and the reason is because of the time sensitivity. We have we've to got, irrigate, we have got to get it out of there. So the contact with the eye is time of time is of the essence. So that's really, really emergent. The second category here is sort of like, okay, now next step down is what they call very urgent, which is the, the person who might have a perforate or rupture globe. And then everything else kind of falls into the urgent category. They even put corneal abrasion in the urgent category uh, along with retinal detachment. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, if those are, sure. I, don't, I don't really consider those to be the same either. urgency, but I they put either. them in the same bucket for uh -uh. some reason. No, retinal so detachment pretty, would be more in the very yeah, urgent exactly, to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it really ranges from urgent to emergent depending on those things we just walked through. We got to do a careful, complete exam to the best of our ability with this kid yeah. and their age appropriateness. And remembering that the burns are a really big deal. Alkali is worse than acid, except for hydrofluoric acid, which, which is, is always really bad. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, you know, irrigate, irrigate, irrigate with a goal of a normal pH. We see a lot of corneal abrasions. They're super common. We're going to treat them symptomatically. You might see a traumatic hyphema. If you do, talk to an ophthalmologist. Some of those will get admitted. Some of them might be able to go home. We're really worried about re-bleeding re in those cases. Orbital fractures can happen, and certainly what we worry about there is entrapment of the muscles, particularly the inferior rectus muscle with an inability to look up. And if you have any kind of visual loss that's associated with a story of trauma to the eye, that's going to be a, something that's going to need a deeper exam. And mm -hmm. that may also mandate opto. opto. Yeah, correct. That's that. All right. Yeah. That's the kids' eyeballs.